Very good. How about a call to order? Commissioner Ashworth? Here. Commissioner Banks? Here. Commissioner Hassler? Here. Commissioner Schwern? Here. I guess before we um, get truly into some of the nuts and bolts, a couple of other things, may we leave with the Pledge of Allegiance, please? Please rise. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. And lastly, may we have a moment of silence for our fallen officers at the hand now. Joplin, Missouri. Thank you. Last we heard, we don't go on until we're not doing this again next month. The other ones. Open discussion. Anything for the open discussion? Please report. Morning, Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Um, I am not Chief Gregory. Uh, he regrettably is involved in a meeting or a meeting with the regional business council this morning, so he has to just stand in. Before I get started with the agenda, commissioners, is there anything that I can answer? That's hanging out there from the last meeting. Okay. Um, first item up is the budget. Joyce is on vacation this month. She assures me that everything is in light. So she will have a much more detailed updated version next month, but we are currently right where we need to be. So everything two months in is, is right where we need to do. So before we move on, is there any remaining? Perhaps uh, the new person still anything from 2021 that would roll over and it would close the budget and it would close the year. I just don't know how that fiscal responsibly works. Is, it, is that completely done? Nothing else. It's, it's very, very close. And I, and I know from talking to her last week, we were talking about some issues with media relations and some funding that they need moving forward. And she was closing those books out last week right before she left. So I'd like to give you an answer. I don't have it off the top of my head. I certainly have it. Thank you. Okay, and one other item that I'd like to address too, and I know that the, the board is aware of this, but for those that are listening that may not be kind of related to the budget, the council at this past meeting, but the meeting before approved our request for the CAD upgrade, $4.2 million. So that's going to allow us to move communications into the 21st century and address some of the issues that we had. So thank you to the board for the support. And that's a big item for us. So I wanted everybody out there to see. What is our what is our timing on implementation? About 18 months. So from the time that the contract is signed, I talked to some people in communications earlier in the week when they were in the building. There's a lot of migration of data data that needs to happen. So from the time that we actually write the first check, sign the contract, it's a full implementation is about 18 months. That is why it's so critical to get that done. Because every day that we have under the old system. It's not quick, but the propensity for failure goes down day by day as we implement the new system. A lot of it is changing some of the, the things that don't talk to each other very well. So they'll be they'll be moving forward on that here very, very shortly. Do you know how quickly we can get that contract signed? Uh, I don't, but I'll find out. It, it's relatively quick now that the funding's been approved. That was a major hurdle. So voter list ready to go, Regis is ready to go, everybody's on board. It's just a matter of signing on the line of we, so we don't meet for another month, and I assume required that we vote to approve that contract. Good question. I don't know. I don't. You know, either one of you know, Troy or Jerry, who's in it. Whether or not the board would have to approve that contract, or whether that's a service it's agreement. agreement. It's already existing agreement with Regis. Yeah, I think that's all right. We can yeah. basically go run through Regis. We already have our new I think what you're asking okay. is if we have to wait another month, to be able to, we don't want to do that. So okay. should that be the case, I will certainly let you know. We'll move it. Okay. Yeah, we're so not going to wait a month for you to approve that contract. If you can get it done, we'll work. I don't want to speak for the rest of you, but I'd be willing to hop on a special meeting to approve I that. I agree a lot of there. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Great question. The, uh, okay. Thanks, Sheldon. You want to come up and talk about this now? 
Members of the board, good morning. Good morning. Uh, so today, oh, I think you all have the pie chart included in there. You can see that none of the recommendations uh, for the month of February were completed or denied. However, just because there's no changes to that pie chart, several things are getting very close to completion. I'll update you on a few of those. Uh, Many of the recommendations from Teneo came to five zero updates of policy. One of those is uh, going to be voted on by you all today, and that's the social media policy. So, assuming that that gets a signature today, then that will be completed for next month, uh, as well as uh, the revision to the canine policy, which Teneo's recommendation was to follow the IACP model policy. That has been written. Uh, it's been through uh, my office. To the deputy chief, and it's going to be a way with uh, executive command staff. So, assuming timeline uh, at the latest May, but possibly even before that. Um, and then two others uh, revisions on search and seizure policy and uh, search on aerial surveillance, which actually will roll into that policy as well, would satisfy two more Teneo recommendations. And those procedures have been written and are now moved off to stakeholder review. So, i.e., the county counselor's office, FOP, ESOP. Um, crime analyst to uh, DCI and Division of Criminal Investigations. Uh, one of the noted recommendations was a crime analyst to robbery homicide. Uh, that re to reclass uh, request was made from a PO position to a professional staff position, and uh, they're moving along with that as well. And then from the Division of Operational Support, there was a legal update for open records, as you guys are aware. Uh, Two things. One was to change and rewrite the bureau order that is done and now uploaded in the Power EMS. And then the second is the board policy for the release of information, which obviously is pending your review when it happened. And finally, the upgrade to the CAD system that Chief Ludwig just spoke about. Just moving along as well. Questions regarding today? Sure. We'll go ahead and move on to uh, the crime statistics. February. So obviously, um, over the last three months, I, I like this notable events slide that we've been giving you um, for the entire thing continue to be down in all categories, which is obviously huge. I know that we had the massive focus on the use of force incidents uh, last month uh, from the 2021 breakdown, well, 19 through 21, really. The use of force incidents 2022 year to date, I can tell you, uh, it was 17. In January and down to 14 in February now. Again, shorter month, but uh, it's good that overall we're down almost 30 percent there. Um, we've also added, as I told you, the failure failure to yield category here. So we're at 239 for the year. That would be January and February, obviously combined. Uh, I told you that we would do a further breakdown on this. All right, so um, here you can see uh, a breakdown by precinct on how many failure to yields that we've had, uh, as well as a map created by Eddie Orschland from, uh, from my bureau. There is, uh, so about 55% of these, 131 of the 239 occurred in either the first precinct or uh, precinct eight, which is the Jennings precinct. Um, south would be uh, another 57 obviously come from precincts three and four. Uh, on a month to month basis, again, several fewer in February, um, but again, we're talking about a little bit of a shorter month. A lot of it has to do, again, in my opinion, as we move through these, all of these slides, again, just the extreme cold temperatures that we've had. Uh, for instance, there was four days in, and I checked it in February where uh, 
our precincts were on emergency status pretty much the whole day or county offices had closed the day or early. So that all has to be taken into account. But we'll continue to do this. And if you'd like to see anything else um, on the failure to yield portion, just let us know because obviously we're willing to expand that. And we, we will continue to do so as well. But if there's anything specific that you all would like to see, let us know. So we go to the neighbors, the crimes against persons. Um, the top one that is always focused on murders uh, are down from 2021. Uh, a couple other things of note on this slide. There's a, I have another slide uh, here regarding the homicides. Um, but we talked last month about the aggravated assaults. And if you remember, which I, I said, I'm sure your question is, why are we down so much? Uh, and I didn't really have the explanation. It's, it's, it was one month. Uh, and I cautioned that let's just see how February goes. And uh, so. We're still down overall, as you can see, from 221 to 154, but that gap has closed. So in February alone, whereas in January, there was a discrepancy between 130 and 70, so 60 uh, total different. Now we're at 91 February of 21 to 84 February of 22. So that gap is starting to close as far as the aggregate assaults are concerned. Here's the homicide uh, infograph. Faith Kessler puts together on behalf of crimes against persons. Uh, again, a couple of things to note here uh, of the 10 homicides investigated by uh, the St. Louis County Police Department's crimes against persons. Uh, all 10 of those so far this year have been for firearm. The breakdown on the, uh, the other chart here shows exactly sort of the motive on these things. Does anybody have any questions regarding this sheet? Appreciate it. The simplicity of it and the information that's that's communicated. Yeah, she does a fantastic job. Yeah. Absolutely. It's just it's very simple to look at and get very quickly get to what the, the content is. The clearance rate says 138%. So that would be from pre so murders that have been cleared from previous years as well. So mm -hmm. of the 10, oh, 10. Yeah, how many are still outstanding? Those which are all cleared so far. They're all, all cleared. cleared this year. So when we move on to property, uh, I didn't notice a massive change really in anything other than the uh, the motor vehicle thefts. You know, we talked about that massive spike in January again, starting to regress again. Uh, we have 179 of those motor vehicle thefts out of the 293 over in January. We're now down to 114 in February, so another 36% increase there. Uh, and then the robberies uh, at 16 each month for 32, but again, still down there, which is not so close. Uh, crimes against society. This is where last month we kind of focused on uh, the numbers being way down as far as the drug and narcotic violations. And I told you that a lot of that stems from our drug unit, uh, drug, drug enforcement. Who does a great job, and I spoke to you about the PCI, the Bounty Crime Initiative. So we've created a few slides uh, that I'll put up here in a second, um, just to show the great work. And obviously, the, the Violent Crime Initiative is driven from our anti-gang unit uh, within the Bureau of Drug Enforcement. However, uh, tactical operations, special response unit, canines, and special operations all assist in this, as well as the precincts, uh, whatever they have. The manpower to give up will will help as well facilitate some of this stuff. So, I'm sorry. I'll go back here. Um, in 2022, if we look at the drug narcotic violations, so it was 100, and I said I'm pretty confident from last month that this would go up. So it was 100. So that means 192 in February alone. Uh, drug narcotics arrests. When we look at the uh, BCI, you can see here that. Uh, what the guys did is work a total of 26 days over the past two months, so January and February, for a total of 208 hours. So again, when I go through the next few slides, just take that into context that this is 26 days worked at the numbers that these guys, guys and gal, I'm sorry, have, have produced. So this is just the narcotics seized, again, just in the 26 days from the Violent Crime Initiative. Uh, to put that into more 
obviously they break it down. They meaning the drug unit breaks it down by grams. Um, if you look at meth, which is the, from the pie chart is uh, the black in color, that uh, we've accounted for about 21 pounds of meth seized in the 26 days. And then they don't even put marijuana into the pie chart because it's so great. That's uh, the 55,400 grams, which is heaped at the equivalent of about 122 pounds seized just off of the BCI again in 26 days. And then the third slide that we put in here is some of the seizures that we've done. Uh, 32 stolen vehicles taken, uh, recovered in the 26 days, as well as 62 total firearms, which amounts to about 2.4 weapons per day that they actually work this, and 115 total arrests or four and a half arrests per day. And again, these guys are only working. This is not, I, I should preface this too by saying when they work these days, these are five hour blocks. Now, there is overtime accounted at some point. Uh, but the, it's all scheduled in five hours, so it's not even a full eight hour day where this continues to drive our self initiated type numbers up. Sean, it's interesting that you went to days. I was sitting here doing the same thing. We have about six drug arrests um, every day. We have about four cars stolen every day, one recovered each day. It's just easy for me to translate it that way. That's just pretty substantial. Yet, when you look at the population that we're covering, it doesn't seem, I mean, any one's bad, right? Yeah. It just pretty nice statistics that you said they're bad. Absolutely. The yeah. job that they do is so, it's, it's, it's. so we'll go into uh, calls for service. A um, couple of things to note again, I can get on this, but the extreme cold temperatures in January and February this year have kept both of those categories uh, lower than our moving average pretty much in every precinct of direct calls for service. Uh, it's the same as self-initiated, as you can see, um, moving average January and February of this year are going to be, for the most part, below in almost every precinct as well. But again, nothing that is substantial that jumps off the page to me when I review all of these, uh, these numbers. Top call is always going to be sick case. You're going to see that pretty much every month. These, uh, these tend to stay pretty much the same across the board month to month. And then finally, our TSR data, which I broke down. So this is obviously February. I looked into January. Um, when I look at percent minority stops in each one of the precincts, there's no deviation greater than 3% one way really or the other. So um, point being in the first two months, we've pretty much been status quo across the board. Uh, as I explained to you last month, we do have the bias free policing committee, which I'm a part of that looks into this every quarter. And if we see any discrepancies from individual officers, that's what's discussed. And obviously, we come to a higher level there. But in the first two months, nothing deviates um, you know, that far outside. Question. Sir. Now, these, the traffic stops, I'm assuming that those are connected to the failure to yield. Fail, the, the failure to stop people are mostly traffic stops. So we don't, so the failure to yield is no traffic stop. There's no truth. So because they just basically right, but I mean, the, I mean, the, the, the reason that they're you're trying to stop them is generally a traffic. Uh, it could be, it could be a plethora of things. Yes, there are very many times that, uh, that it's just a traffic related offense. Uh, it could be that somebody runs a license plate or the rig of real time game. crime center tells us that, Hey, this is a stolen vehicle that they tried to affect uh, a stop on that takes off. Um, so it, it could be a plethora of things. Still won't be able to fall into the uh, pursuit of suit out there. Right? But but there's there's no dive into on those people who don't stop what the underlying cause for so attempting to pull them over was. Uh, there could be there could always be a dive into anything if you know, and uh, I'm willing to do that. The way that it's tracked right now, uh, there's no way to know that. So that those are discussions that we can definitely have. Uh, it's, I can tell you just briefly uh, way that it's tracked. So an officer attempts to make a traffic stop uh, and that vehicle takes off. It does not meet our pursuit policy. So he immediately terminates by uh, turning his lights and siren off and turning in the other direction. Uh, he notifies the dispatcher who then makes a separate call for service and logs it as a failure to yield. So it's incumbent on that police officer then to go back and enter notes into our CAD system to say, Hey, I tr tried to stop this car from speeding. Right. Plates, yeah, exactly. uh, plate for bad. Or and it's a little bit harder there because then it's not hard. I mean, but it takes 
it's more man hours like for some of my analysts to do because I didn't have to go back through each one of the comments okay. and start logging. So okay. it's a little bit harder. Okay. So I'm scanning the, the column of total stops, looking, you know, kind of comparing the precincts, not that it should, right? So that's my first personal watch out, but I look at the variability of kind of some outliers, right? The the group tends to concentrate toward the middle, but there's a couple of outliers on each end. Is there any substance to that? In other words, West County has 520 stops. That um, Fenton only has 66. So is that is that something that is just normal, or is there a concentrated effort in one? Or a... no, I don't think so. That, that that is driven by the precinct commanders and the supervisors on you know what type of enforcement. Uh, West County, let's just take for instance because you mentioned that. Obviously, West County is going to be and it is. It's higher by. About 300 yet yeah, than North County. And the reason being, I mean, you just look at the calls for service volume, right? So even though the North County precinct may have, and I don't know this off the top of my head, somebody in here does, but 13 or 14 beats to fill, and let's say that they are at full staff, those guys are still running call to call to call. They do not have the time to make the, the, as many traffic stops, whereas the West County may have uh, nine or 10 beats, and their call volume, you know, their guys in a 10 hour shift, or now they're working 12 hour shifts. May only respond to four or five calls, giving you know, and even if that averages out to an hour per call, let's just say for the sake of argument, they still have seven hours to conduct self initiated activity. So, a lot of that falls into the call boundaries from the precincts. And just are the officers, do they have the time to be able to do some of these self initiated things, which clearly the traffic stop is? Thank you. That's all I have. The other thing I'd like to add about the West County traffic stops is it's still uh, it's West County is one of the pilot precincts right now for 12 hour shifts. So they enjoy 100% staffing. So they can get a, a sense of what's going on with 12 hour shifts. So they are, they do have the ability to ride some two man cars. So they're out there, they're much more proactive because not only do they have the full beats, but they also have some two man cars, which tends to lend itself to more system self activity. Same for the additional. So, uh, quick staffing update. We currently have 71 vacancies. That's a 7% vacancy rate with commission with professional staff. We have 23 vacancies. That's a 6% vacancy rate and, uh, class 204 is ongoing. They'll graduate in June. There's still 19 recruits there. There's also a municipal and open enrollment recruits there for class 205. We have. That's in uh, April. We have uh, five officers so far. The munis, and there will be additional open enrollment. They're being tested this Saturday. Could be up to 14 additional on the open enrollment part. And then uh, tomorrow we have three final review boards. Uh, one candidate is for the June class because they're finishing up their bachelor's degree, and the other two candidates will be for the April class. The uh, Dispatcher Academy started January 31st with seven dispatchers. Class number 13 for the Dispatcher Academy starts April 11. And last month in February, we had nine applications for police officer. We currently have seven in backgrounds. They're, um, the recruiting team right now is at SEMO, Southeast Missouri State, addressing criminal justice majors and other may and other folks that may be interested. They recently attended University of Central Missouri and addressed the criminal justice crowd there. That's traditionally a Western Missouri, Eastern Kansas type attendance with their student body, but they were able to get two solid applications for that. And, and I'm thrilled at the two. And I've always maintained it's all about singles. There's no home run. So there's two singles right there if those candidates hopefully work out. And just to talk about community outreach unit a little bit, we had uh, Pal had their Black History Trivia Month uh, trivia night recently, and they raised $4,100 for the, the Pal unit. Um, the chief table that I was at, we were in first place up until the sixth round. So uh, we're pretty competitive, but uh, lost it in, toward the end there. But 
Uh, the community outreach unit also posts a, a monthly video. It's called Community Corner, and it just explains what the community outreach unit does, and it explains involvement with the community outreach unit and the police and the community. It's about five minutes in duration. It's on our all our social media platforms and so forth, where you can find it. On uh, March the 11th, we have Chess Caps and Kids Luncheon from 11 to 1 at Gary Gore Elementary. Chief Gregory and Chief Hayden will be there, so it's a collaborative effort with the, with the city also. And then the PAL unit this summer is going to open up things a lot more than they have in the previous two years because of COVID. A lot of outdoor activities, a lot of involvement uh, with the kids taking them on various activities. <laughs> If you don't mind, yes, the, the rate of recruitment out of the university when we make university visits, you talked about in central Missouri, uh, having two come out of there. We normally have a strong application rate when we make visits to SEMO or South. We do normally have at least two or three. It's and with with UMSL and the other area colleges, more of a, a continual. Uh, uh, effort so that you know that stream in. I wouldn't gauge those by visits because we're there a lot. UMSL, um, a lot of our uh, specialty units will go there at the request of the professors there and and give a presentation on bomb and arson or forensics or you know any garden variety that interests that professor for the particular class. So we we're almost constantly getting referrals from UMSL, either it's word of mouth or the professors actually being proactive and we have a very positive relationship with them. And uh, as far as the community colleges uh, go, I have a meeting at four o'clock today with them, so. Is it safe to assume that our competition for talent is with other police departments and with other agencies, the FBI, the whomever it might be. Is that is that who we're competing with for these criminal? Defense? For those that are interested in law enforcement, and then our competition is obviously with any other type of work element outside law enforcement. You know, as as we all know, just everybody's clamoring for workers, and so it goes a little bit beyond uh, just law enforcement agencies, but. Within that context of somebody that knows they want to be in law enforcement and are dead set on it, that's our competition. Part of our recruiting strategy then is for those who don't know what they want to convince them to move into law. That too, yes, sir. Thank you. Um, the dispatch, you talked about seven now, and then you talked about the April class. How many do we have for the April class? I think we have six right now. Six right now. It's the capacity. Well, and we've talked about inching that up a little bit more. They, there's an issue, as I've discussed before, with rolling them out into their field training, their, their training, that there's only so many trainers on the floor. So it's kind of a, a catch-22 there, but we're working on that. And the logo, the vein of competition, friendly competition. Are the Chiefs playing chess? Um, you don't have a confession? <laughs> Neither one of them play chess. <laughs> In prior months, you provided resignation stats. Do you have those? For the year, seven police officers, seven professional staff, and then also on top of that, six retirements, which the retirements we expected, of course. Two months, that's another February and engaged. We've lost 20. We're roughly running about 10 a month right now. For right. Run rate. Are we the resignations? Are we losing them to other departments or law enforcement? It's about half and half. Some of it is to the private sector, like I talked about, and then it's to other law enforcement agencies. Or out of the industry. Out of the yes, about half and half. Thank you. Third grade chess champion. One snow level. Oh, sorry, you still have the trophy. Oh.
Ladies and gentlemen of the board, I'm Chris Kester from the Crisis Intervention Unit. Good morning. Um, what I have here is a summary of the Crisis Intervention Unit's um, productivity for 2021. So it, it's brief, but it's pretty comprehensive, and I'll do my best to answer your questions um, after I go through this. Chris, can I run for just a minute? Because I sure. might be watching and don't know what CAT can you do. If, if it's not already built in your presentation, you talk a little bit about what the group does and why we do Sure, it? sure. Um, our unit. Follows up with folks in the community that are living with behavioral health problems uh, in an attempt to connect them to resources. Now, we get um, our referrals in a number of different ways. We get them by email, we get them by phone calls, and we also, uh, as a team, go through all of the reports that are generated from week to week. We triage those reports and then we decide which reports we want to try to follow up on person in person and uh, which reports. We will then basically refer to the CBHLs, the community behavioral health liaisons, to follow up with, um, with phone calls. Some of those phone calls may also turn into face to face visits. Uh, it just depends on, on the circumstances. So we do our best to reach out to as many folks as we can that we know are disconnected from care in some capacity, whether it's separated from their medication or don't have access to, uh, to mental health care at all. And we have uh, unique relationships with providers like uh, BJC. Um, BJC offers us the opportunity to connect folks to services at no charge. So we um, we have a lot to do. It's a busy it's a busy place to work. Does that answer your question? Please, I just want to make sure if there are people watching that understand the sure. importance of what we do, how critical it is, and uh, how novel it is. Right? Of course, aggressive. So let's uh, let's get right into it then. So monthly averages um, for the year uh, in the CIU uh, unit, in the crisis intervention unit, we had 2,314 total referrals. That comes from the CIT reports, the emails, and the phone calls. Like I said, out of those 2,314 referrals, 1,701 face-to-face -face contacts were made. So 1,700 of those folks were contacted by our unit face-to-face. The remaining 600 were referrals to the CBHLs for, for bone follow up. And I mentioned the community behavioral liaisons uh, already. Just so you know, we have four that are assigned to the crisis intervention unit. They come from Barnes Jewish, they come from BHR, behavioral health response. We also, our newest um, CBHL comes from ARCA, Assisted Recovery Centers of America. Uh, and so they work with us day to day in terms of trying to get folks connected. So there's four assigned to us. Um, from there, I'll go to the crisis negotiation team for just a moment. We had 16 total callouts for 2021, and then we had six uh, CNT only callouts. So total callouts would include uh, responding with tactical operations for armed barricade subjects. Uh, the six additional CNT callouts, or the six CNT only callouts, I should say, were for folks um, that were suicidal barricaded uh, and our commanders elect to try to not escalate the situation by just deploying the negotiators uh, in terms of trying to mitigate the crisis. Uh, we had also, an, uh, on top of that, we had 150 total hours of training in 2021. Uh, from there, we, mo we move into some of the other work that we're doing in the community. So uh, in 2021, we had regular contact with the county counselor's office, the state prosecutor's office, and with the probate commissioners, obviously, in an effort to build those relationships um, and ultimately help more people. Um, we're also involved, as you probably know, in a tremendous amount of instruction yearly. We had 40, uh, I'm sorry, we had five 40 hour basic classes in CIT for our officers, not only in unincorporated St. Louis County, but the municipalities as well. Uh, we had uh, four eight hour advanced classes, one 21, 24 hour veterans class. We had uh, one 24 hour youth class and then two 16 hour dispatcher classes. We also provide uh, some training on de escalation and mental health first aid to recruits and recruit class that goes through the, uh, the academy. Uh, community outreach presentations we do three to five of those a month. Um, and as, actually, as uh, we were talking about recruiting and all that just a few moments ago, uh, we actually present at all the area universities uh, in terms of crisis intervention and how we work in the community. And I'm, I'm hoping that helps bring folks that, uh, you know, are, are interested in behavioral health work to the police department in, in some capacity. 
uh, homeless outreach, which you all might be very interested in because it was new for 2021. So we had a total of 555 referrals uh, that our homeless outreach officer uh, dealt with for us. 487 of those uh, were located and services were offered. Uh, and they listed here an 83% positive contact and some level of services accepted. So that uh, sounds like that was a, a pretty good outcome from, from all of those uh, from all of those contacts. From here, I'll switch to patrol and just kind of give you some brief numbers in terms of calls for service for CIT related incidents. So um, in 2021, CIT calls for service, so that would include EDP, which is an emotionally disturbed person, violent EDP, and then attempt suicide. There were 5,628 5, total calls for service, which is a decrease of 2,361 calls for service from 2020. Out of that 5,628 calls, 1,396 CIT reports were generated. 37 uh, out of that, the, those total number of calls, 37 um, involved a, a use of force, a less lethal use of force. So that's 2.6% of our overall calls involved some capacity of force, right? So we had to put hands on folks to get them safely into, into custody. Um, so the pr pretty good numbers, and those are pretty consistent, um, you know, over the years here. In comparison, I'll give you the stats for 2020. We had 7,989 total calls for service, 602 CIT reports generated, 29 overall uses of force. So that's a 1.9% use of force uh, statistic for that total of 7,989 calls. Uh, in 2019, uh, CIT calls for service were 4,425. Um, CIT reporting just went online, so there's there's no more there's no more information that was gathered from from that here at this point. So, with that, I know that was a whole lot, but I'll I'll do my best to answer your questions. So I have a question. Uh, numbers really high in the Have you any idea? Well, I could, I, I, could, I could offer a guess. My guess would be all the great work the crisis intervention unit was well, doing. <laughs> right? <laughs> the community <laughs> outreach brought our numbers down, what, 20%? Um, I, I would imagine there's a number of factors. Certainly, we um, we, we love what we do. We, we recognize saving lives all of the time. And I hope overall, you know, the, the message of CIT and crisis intervention is is getting out in St. Louis County, um, you know, in a manner that's going to allow us to make a bigger difference with every year that's ahead of us. I hope that is. I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure, certainly. Sure, thank you. So, 1,396 CIT reports generated last year. What kind of information is being reported? Uh, there, so we have a actually, um, and Lieutenant Romo is here in the room with us. Uh, back in probably 2015, St. Louis kind of received a grant to rewrite the CIT reporting system. Uh, that has been done, um, and we are now working uh, collaboratively with the state to get that reporting system to be used statewide. And it will be the first one in the nation for that matter. Um, in terms of the information it collects, uh, it's you know everything from general pedigree type of information for folks, uh, right through to who, who their support person is, um, you know, if they have a diagnosis from a medical professional, uh, all the way down through what happened in the referral process. Um, and so there's there's lots of different things there that not only now because of this new reporting system. Can we utilize uh, here in St. Louis County, but almost statewide now we're working on that and then, you know, ultimately, uh, you know, we have search options now that are certainly going to make us better at targeting things moving forward. So, based on that reporting, can we are we able to say. We got 5600 calls for service and we provided. X number of. I don't know, connecting individuals with service providers or connecting people with their. I guess what I'm trying to ask is, is there a way to report the actions beyond 
going out to somebody's home or to somebody's location, what we actually did while we were there. Um, so there, there is a summary portion or narrative portion to that to that report. So every report um, and, and moving forward, uh, you know, our team here in St. Louis County just added a, um, a supplement, you know, portion to the report. So now in our office, we can go and follow up on a report that was generated at the patrol level and then enter, enter a, uh, a supplemental narrative that says, yes, we were able to meet with this person, connect them to this resource. Um, and here's where we're at. And the power of it, obviously, is that every CIT officer, not only in the county, but ultimately the state is going to be able to refer to that when that person goes in and out of crisis and realize, you know, maybe what is the most effective approach. So, I hope that, I hope yeah, that it does, because. My question was, you know, are we able to document the results of our efforts, but it sounds like. We're able to document the results of our efforts and if there's a second call, third call, fourth call, we're able to build off of the relationship, even if it's not the same CIT officer visiting the individual services. Absolutely. The yeah, the, yes, the, there's a lot of a lot of different ways that documentation can be used in terms of trying to support that person when they're in crisis. Thank you. That was my very first question. So love all the statistics, right? The three fourths of the <clears throat> referrals end up in a face to face. That's pretty remarkable when you talk roughly three fourths of our homeless or our unhoused referrals um, receive some sort of help. That, that, that's pretty remarkable stuff. So there's some statistics there. I think Michelle asked the right question. How do we measure the impact of the work we do? Because the work's pretty darn good. I mean, it's extraordinarily good. Just remarkable. But she's asked that question, so I'll move on. Ask it. Richard, did you have any? No, go ahead. I have a couple more to ask in there. Um, you mentioned all of the training that goes on. Approximately how many, what percentage of our officers or what number of our officers have been trained in some of the CIT techniques? Uh, I want to say that we hover around 70% of our officers trained in CIT. Would be a guess, or not an absolute, but a guess. No. Um, you know, I, I know that uh, it's nice when we come into the class on the Monday morning of a 40 hour training. And, you know, initially we want to ask who is volunteered to be here, right? Uh, because we want the officers that want to do this work to be the first one trained. And, uh, you know, 95% of folks in our average 40 hour class are saying, we want to be here. We want to know more about this. We want to do this work over and above that. I know that, you know, that surge, you know, helps to keep our numbers high. So we're able to dispatch CIT trained officers when there's calls for that service. So I'm not sure that it's necessarily a demand on commanders. To make sure those numbers stay where they need them to be because it's kind of happening automatically. It's, it is amazing that the change in the perspective of how we support our community through a way of policing that hasn't been done in the past, right? That's not just do what perhaps we would have done 20 years ago if somebody was acting strange, right? We, we figure out a way to de escalate and help them. So it is a totally different approach. And it's modern with the collaboration of the CDHLs that really are funded through the state of Missouri. It's it's been you know a, a wonderful you know way to, to reach these folks and get them connected. We certainly wouldn't be nearly as effective if we didn't have that program. So, Commissioner Schwerner's question: What the results we're getting is there a way to get some more of the uh, the CBHLs? Uh, well, the, right now we basically have full time uh, availability of four of them. So, sir, I would suggest to you that we need to uh, probably uh, dictate. You know, additional officers to CIU work to match that you know relationship. That way, it's a you know we have teams out there in a, in a better capacity than we do now. So yeah. wait, sorry, can yeah, you wait. Are you suggesting that our CBHL capacity exceeds what we're using them for? Do they have extra time on their hands? Uh, I would say that we would be more effective at the street level in terms of outreach. If we had more officers to go with our CBHLs, uh, our CBHLs have uh, they're they're inundated with lots of different things, um, including a lot of phone outreach, which they do obviously on their own. With you know, it's not necessary for us to be involved in that. But in terms of you know all of the uh, you know day to day week to week demands on all of us, the more officers we had, we could you know certainly pair, pair up easier with the CBHL for. That community outreach piece. 
Do our CIT trained patrol officers use CDHLs? Some of them do, yes. That is a message that we're uh, continuing to try to put out there that so our officers know that they can call them directly or they can certainly call our unit, email our unit, and get in contact with them that way. We're always sending that message, yes. I just have one comment, uh, and that is it would be great if there was a way to make the general public aware of the process of I don't think that people in general know, and I'm thinking about that as far as uh, the perception of what police officers do. This is a huge, huge uh, piece. I think that could really change some attitude. So it's just a copy, but I think that it's really important for us to investigate how to publicize this a uh, whole lot more than it's been. And, and, and the, with the collaborations and all of that stuff. Yes, ma'am, and we're absolutely in favor of that. Like I said, we're we're out three to five times a month doing a general presentation. You know, for Lillian Lynn University, Sandwich University, UNSL, um, uh, all of the major universities, not to mention, you know, uh, you know, chaplains, uh, you know, when they get together. And so we're, we're trying to uh, spread the word in, in any manner we get the opportunity to do so. That's, but we, we enjoy that part. We just trained uh, the entire Metro West uh, Fire and Mass. Um, so, you know, you would think. They would be aware of it that, you know, they don't, they don't understand to what extent what well, we've gone um, as a police department to train folks and, and make this connection with those in need. And that's the, and that is the problem. Average person on the street doesn't know. There's a good yeah. that this, uh, uh, they can access the service. And that is ex extremely you need to at some point how to really publicize what partnerships that you have. Success rates, I think, all of that to be public information because what happens with the universities is that they really is still in silo. They aren't right. running out and tell people. Right. They got the information for right. themselves, but I think that the general public really benefit. Yeah, we would take we would take any opportunity to, to, to spread the word for sure. That's what I think I hear I think I hear perhaps are saying is Face to face is great, universities are great, but what's perhaps a broader way to get this information out? What type of social media tools are we doing? Yeah, what type of ways are we getting this work out there that, that may have, that may be traditional for us, but much more traditional. I was listening to all that, thinking the same thing. Sergeant Panis and I just made eye contact. I didn't see her, I was standing on the floor too. I thought there and she nodded at me. So why take it? And hand on the shoulder means Chris, you're done. <laughs> Now, Commissioner, it's just, just to add a point to that. So we've had discussions, Chief Gregory and I, over the last several months about marketing of departments in a more proactive manner. And out of those discussions, there's some increased capacity that you heard me talk about media relations earlier when you were asking about the 2021 closing out budget. Some of those conversations took place because we're adding capacity to media relations and increasing what they're going to be doing. One of those pieces is to better market what we know we do excellently already, but maybe the public doesn't understand. So when I heard you ask that question, Commissioner, fit nicely into that, and I'm sure Tracy Panis' mind is already working on how we can. I was looking for you too. I was standing in the back because usually you're standing up, but I didn't see you. So. Thank you, sir. Great work. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, here to provide an update on the sunshine uh, where we're at. First, I want to start with Commissioner uh, Answorth asked a question for the top five. Um, I can come up with four, they kind of put it together a little bit. But number one is going to be the uh, insurance agents uh, for accident reports. Uh, number two is public, public or citizens uh, requesting uh, police reports, 911 calls, pictures, stuff like that. Law enforcement agencies slash companies that one, they're doing background checks or something for employees, um, and then attorneys who want all the gamut of who they're representing, what the case is. Um, from there, I want to give a quick update on 
where we were in the last board on February 16th. You know, the total we had was 23,441 requests. Uh, as of this morning at 7 a.m., we had 24,397, which computes to 956 new requests in the two week time period. Uh, and then uh, online payments. Wait, when, you get, when you say that, is that net increase? That's an increase mm -hmm. over the total, yes. So this it's all, like these are new. New ones. New okay. ones. Uh, and then give you an update online payments. Uh, strike with them so that they can make payment in the next request. To move the process a little bit quicker. We're currently waiting on an opinion from the county counselor's office regarding the ability to pass along those fees to make that online payment. Well, all allows us to do that. That is in their realm to be determined. Yes, to be determined. They sh we should have something they said this week, so I can update you on that once it goes live. Okay. What, are, what are our barriers to being able to do this extraordinarily systemically, smoothly, quickly, accurately, all the things that the, all the leads that, that everybody wants? It's just manpower. If we, if we, we have manpower, we have everything in place, uh, everybody trained. Um, you know, the chiefs uh, and everybody have been given us limited duty people to assist us with that manpower. So once we get that, we have a system in place uh, with our tag system. We can tag it. So seniority hierarchy of getting things in and out as quickly as possible. So, so we have the technology we need. We just need to do that. Yes. So different way. I'm not trying to put words yeah, in my mouth. No, that what you said. That's correct. Yeah, training. Questions. How how are you currently training when people come in? How are you <laughs> currently? We sit them down and walk them through uh, the process, the steps to utilize that system. So it requires your your time to sit down every time any person comes in. Yes. How long does that usually take? Depends on the person that we're training, so to grasp it. Okay. But usually, I mean, the sim the simple request gives you a day or two. We can probably get them up and running. Uh, but they also have to understand the sunshine law itself. Uh, so that may take a little bit more time to understand that aspect of it, but general generalization, they can do it maybe one or two days comfortably. Unlike that accident means, reports. If you have two people coming in a month, let's just say you're spending three to four days training those two people to get up to speed. Yes. And then how long are they usually in before they cycle out of the It depends on their but it's limited duty, whatever okay. the, the time frame of that is. Some may be weeks, some may be months. So we try to identify people that are going to be there for an extended period of time for, for assignments like that that require a little bit more training. If it's just simply a couple of days, we wouldn't send them down there to help. So we, we build that in before we approve those assignments. I wonder if there's a more effective way to train. And I'm not advocating putting somebody in front of a video, but if you could do the training once, then that would save three to four days. Of, I'm just making numbers up, but you know, days of, of your time. There are webinars, but it's uh, so generalized. Uh, it's more of a hands on okay. training to actually fully understand capabilities. Great, great ideas planted, right? How do we take four days down to three days to have more productivity? Thank you. Thank you, again. Anything else? Anything else? Yeah, we had a conversation last month about the body camps and how we're using those in training. Deputy, any update on how we're using the body cams as we train our officers so they can get a real time view. I'll oh, we'll leave it there. You yes, sir. So I had conversations with both Mr. Becker and with Lieutenant Colonel Cox this morning about that. And it's kind of a two part answer. So the first part is kind of on the street level, how the supervisors, once they view those body cam videos and they identify some, some of the good things and maybe some things that, that could be improved on how they use those. So Colonel Cox is working with precinct captains to get those incorporated into the roll calls. So local kind of right there training. 
then I guess the question is then how do we expand that opportunity with our own people down at the academy level? And so Mr. Becker had a discussion with, with Jerry Kelly, Captain Kelly down there this morning. They haven't done that to this point. It's not because we can't do it. So that was one of the questions about whether or not that would be possible. And, and he got the answer it is. And actually the FOP has a problem with that. There's no real issue with the CBD on doing that. Typically they're open records anyway, so we can go ahead and utilize that footage. So they're going to look to that opportunity. They do utilize body cam footage, but they try to find other agencies. So they're going to try to flip it a little bit. We're going to work on that communication. So when we identify something like that, that would be useful in the training setting. They become aware of it because right now there's no mechanism for people at the academy to understand what something has value. So we need to clean that up a little bit. Thank you. Speaking of training, I just want to make a, a general comment about the release of the two. Critical incident. Critical incident videos. Um, I personally thought it was very, very well done, um, very well executed, and reflects the general policy. And um, I'm very excited that we have an objective policy of, of how we're going to handle these on a going forward basis. And I know that doing two simultaneously um, was. Well, hopefully will never um, happen again. Um, and I know it was a lot of work. So I just want to, on behalf of the board, extend my appreciation to the whole department for really jumping on board with this initiative and, uh, and producing what was made available to the public. I think it was a very well, well done, great job. Here, here. Took the words right out of my mouth as I was going to close. So, I'm sorry. No, that's right. <laughs> Anytime. Well, not only was it well done, but it's and uh, for the public, but it's, it's the best part is that we're the cutting edge that we're doing it in the region and right. watching the and watching the news coverage and having and seeing other departments interviewed as to now what are you going to do? Uh, basically, so, everyone says we're on top. To that point, I was on a call. Sean when, when we meet with CPA about a month ago, right? uh, no, it wasn't right now, about three weeks ago, the Center for Policing Equity, we were talking about something completely different. At the end of the call, they complimented our department for being so progressive with the release of, with, of that information, being transparent, and, and they do assessments all across the country. So they're involved with law enforcement agencies, not just in the Midwest, but on both coasts. And, and they made the comment, Ted Shulman, correct me if I'm wrong, that it's unheard of in the Midwest for an agency to be that transparent with their critical incidents. So that was very refreshing to hear from that group. And I've heard it many times since. And a lot of that credit obviously goes to the chief and to the board for being progressive in their thoughts, but it also goes to Sergeant Panis and her group for putting together a very professionally produced product that, that just kind of hits the target perfect the whole time. So people who haven't done it before, so they did a phenomenal job. We just go to her group. I don't think anybody out involved in that process, but nothing with positive reviews. That's all I have to. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next for some minutes, we have both the approval and some corrected approvals to go through. So the next couple of things on the board agenda will run in and glove with each other. Let's do the easy one first. We need to approve our minutes from our February 16th, 2022 meeting. That chance for you, though, that we have such a motion. I move that Deborah needs to approve. Second. Further conversation on the February meeting. All in favor of approval? Thank you. Thank you. So we need to correct, we have corrected, and we need to then approve the minutes, the revised minutes for December 15th meeting, and then we will fix what we aired on by. Um, with the next topic on the agenda. So the revised minutes are in our document and those really reflect the correction being we had approved the appellate procedures, but we didn't vote on them. Or I believe our, no, go ahead, fix it. We had a motion to approve them and we failed to vote on that motion. Thank you, which we will do next. So we're going to fix the meeting minutes from the December 15th meeting to indicate that. So with that, the minutes have been, the revised minutes have been given to us. May we have I move we accept the revised minutes. 
Thank you. Thank you. Any further conversation? All in favor of approving the revised minutes of our December 15th meeting, please say. Aye. Thank you. Any opposed? All right. So now we'll approve the appellate procedure. Sorry. We'll vote on the appellate procedure that we discussed and said we were going to approve in December. We have some motion. I move that we approve the revised rules of appellate procedure. I second. Should second it. Any further conversation on those appellate rules? All in favor of approving those appellate rules, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Very good. Thank you. Our apologies for that. Thank you. Our next topic were board priorities. So if you recall last month, we talked about what our priorities would be. These would be dynamic priorities, not static priorities. They may change from month to month. Yeah, put a minimum one year visitation on those. We took some edits back, meaning that um, some of us indicated that we had some language that we wanted to suggest or some edits we wanted to make. Would you please weigh in with whatever edits you have? Seeing you and Michelle specific had some some assignments coming out of that. So so I worked on the first bullet point, which I did not print a copy of. I don't have it in front of me um, what it was, but I I revised it to um, make one of our priorities that we address opportunities for improvement within the department. And then I added a specifically with respect to and then two sub bullets. Um, the first sub bullet was assuring that the department fosters the culture valuing diversity and demanding inclusion. And the second sub bullet is developing our leaders, officers, and professional staff as future leaders of the community and department. I'm going to stop there understanding that there's a concern that only having these two sub bullets um, is limiting and potentially excludes other areas of interest. So I'll stop talking and else you're comfortable that the, the way that we would draft the language would be focusing on our future with specific focus on culture with the mercy inclusion and on your development it doesn't work. Well, include some of the other Potential issues that so All right. So full disclosure, some of the other language that we had in there was, was also around community engagement, improving our communication, things along those lines. We're comfortable with those will be done. They're just not a priority for this board. They will be priorities, obviously, for the department. Your editing of the first um, first bullet, Michelle. No, uh, however, the second bullet I also edited. Oh, thank you. Um, and so I, I changed it to incorporate community engagement. Um, so I think any concerns we might have had by removing community from the first bullet might be addressed here. Um, and it is valuing community engagement and increasing communication with our partners and constituents um, with a sub bullet of continuing to expand integrative crime prevention, criminal justice, and public safety across the entire St. Louis community. Um, the reason I played around with that language is because I wanted to encompass both our department's community engagement and our collaboration with other agencies in our region and hoped that that captured a regional focus for our department. Again, I am, there's no pride in authorship here, so everybody should feel free to tear this. Thank you. I, I'm going to defer because I'd like to take a look at it, right? So I hear what you said. I just would love, love to be able to say it, but thank you for the round. I do like moving some of those around from the, the engagement, communication, a collaboration into the site one about integrated crime prevention. 
because I feel like we have things together better. I'm seeing it. You were going to. Did not. <laughs> So we'll have a working model that we'll continue to address next meeting. So it is the intent that we will commit to finalizing it at least as finalizing finalized that ever will be, right? It's going to be a dynamic document. Very good. Can I just add one comment? Mm -hmm. Even though it's March and we're probably going to not approve this until April, I do think that our work this year so far does reflect many of these bullet points. So I'm usually not one to pat myself on the back, but I'll pat the three of you on your backs um, with respect to work that we've accomplished so far and, and some of our initiatives this year, which I do think reflect these goals and maybe that's a self-fulfilling prophecy because we're also writing these goals for ourselves. But um, but I do think that uh, I just wanted to make that comment. We'll reciprocate. So, if you don't mind, all three of us patting you on the back and try not to knock you down. With us. It is a team and uh, a group. I appreciate that. And I, I would echo it. I think your, your comments dead on, which is we're already starting to live these and how we, how we focus on what we pay attention. All right. Thank you. Public meetings. The conversation was about having the meetings open for public participation, meaning public actually at the meeting last uh, month about some criteria we would use. Is there any updates to the criteria and other additional thinking you have around that criteria? Thank you. Very good. So we'll go ahead and use that criteria as we move forward. I don't know if it needs to be approved because you know, it's dynamic criteria, but um, is it safe to say then, and I guess we probably should take a vote as to whether we will look to open this meeting up for public attendance starting in April. Assuming the criteria is met, right? You think there's any process that we put in place, but our intent would be to move forward if that criteria is met. Yeah. Right. What do we say? Clarification for moving to allow the public space for the business space, but Correct. the meetings have always been open to the public. Correct. That's why we're trying to be careful with the language. So it's public attendance at the physical attendance at the meeting. I would just say, are we all in agreement that this room right here is? Probably not big enough. It's probably up. Yeah. This room is not big enough. Correct. Okay. We've had Diana already reaching out to talk to some people in the county to see what other rooms are available, are available for us using our standard second Wednesday of the month meeting date so that we can talk to that. Don't have to change at times, but make sure that the facility capable of handling. Thank you. We will look to do that, assuming that we have the facility and the other criteria to match. Any letters or communication? Thank you. Any additional old business? Thank you. New business before we get into the contracts. Any additional new business other than what's been listed on the agenda that we have come up since we processed the agenda? Uh, thank you. So we have 16 contracts to present as new business. There are three vendors covered under these 16 contracts. They are all professional service agreements, so we will not identify that. And they are all for the uh, St. Louis County Municipal Police Academy, CMPAs. So we will not identify that as we go through all those. We'll concentrate on um, concentrate the approval of these contracts using the first two vendors, and then we'll vote. We'll go to the third vendor and vote on it since the third vendor has a substantial number of contracts. That's all right. All right. The first one is for a new contract with KFD training and consultation. It is a program around the leads, L E A D S. It's a two day law enforcement active de escalation strategy, leads with implicit bias instructor recertification for June 28th through 29th at a cost not to exceed $6,000. There is a contract with KFD Training and Consultation LLC uh, for leads three day law enforcement deactivate, sorry, law enforcement active de escalation strategy with implicit bias instructor recertification for June 28th through the 30th at a cost not to exceed $9,000. Also with KFD Training and Consulting LLC 
for lockup, four day arrest and control instructor recertification training for May 9 through 12, 2022, at a cost not to exceed $9,000. A new contract for KSD training and consult, consultation LLC for lockup five day arrest and control instructor recertification training on May 9 through 13, 2022, at a cost to exceed, not to exceed $9,800. A new contract with KSD training and consultation LLC for overcoming size differences for female enforcers for December 12 through the 15th, 2022, at a cost not to exceed $9,000. A new contract with KFD Training and Consultation LLC for eight sessions of a program entitled Use of Force Concepts and Analysis for Police Leaders and Trainer Trainers for the time frame from September 13th through November 4th, 2022, at a cost not to exceed $28,800. And lastly, on this section, a new contract with Easter Seals Midwest that will provide three sessions of a program entitled Autism Awareness. Police recruit training between April 1 and December 31, 2022, at a cost not to exceed $4,050. I have a couple of questions that I'm not sure who to bounce those off of. Mr. Becker, if you don't mind, it's really around the first two sets of contracts. The leads training, there's a two day leads training, and then there's a three day leads training. What would be the difference? I think the difference is the three day is obviously a more comprehensive follow up on something you previously received. And, and who would do the two day versus, or who would do the three day versus the two day? Somebody who's previously received that training. So you do the two day first, and then you come back the next year and do the two yeah, day. Yeah, and, and I believe it's changed in the past what qualifies for you to take the longer course. But I can find out. Yeah, if you would, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, same thing with lockup. Thank you for the second question. We're the exact same question on lockup. It's a two day and a three day course, or sorry, a four day and a five day course. And we have the same set of questions around those. Notwithstanding, appreciate if you could get back to us on it. We go through, we'll approve those contracts, but what the contingency that you come back to us on, on what those mean. All right, and we have a motion to approve those contracts. Move approve the contracts. Thank you, Richard. I'll see you with that second. Thank you. Any further conversation on those contracts? All in favor of approving those contracts? All right. Any opposed? Great. The next set of contracts are all with Vista Law Enforcement Training and Consulting LLC. There are nine of those. The first is a new contract with Vista uh, for a three session program entitled 24 Hour Corporate Security Advisor, uh, parentheses CSA, post all inclusive training. On October 4th, 5th, and 6th, 2022, at a cost not to exceed $2,400. A new contract with Vista, three day session on advanced homicide investigations for death investigators for May 16th through the 19th, 2022, at a cost not to exceed $3,200. A new contract with Vista for three sessions for a program entitled Advanced Report Writing Techniques for Investigators, October. 18th through the 20th, 2022, at a cost not to exceed $2,400. A new contract with Vista for three sessions of a program entitled The Courtroom Testimony Tactics and Techniques on October 26, 2022, at a cost not to exceed $800. Another contract with Vista, three sessions of a program entitled Missing Person Investigations on May 25th, at a cost not to exceed $800. A contract with Vista or three sessions of a program entitled New Detective Investigative Investigative Workshop, September 6th through 8th, at a cost not to exceed $2,400. A contract with a new contract with Vista or three sessions of a program entitled Policing in the 21st Century Fair and Impartial Perspectives on August 13th, not to exceed $800. New contract with Vista. For three sessions of a program entitled Participation for Retirement for Law Enforcement Personnel on October 28th at a cost not to exceed $800. And lastly, a new contract with Vista for three sessions of a program entitled Preparation for Retirement for Law Enforcement Personnel on September 23rd, 2022 at a cost not to exceed $800. Questions on those? I was looking uh, so it appears that 
prepared that the consultant will do three chain trainings in one day. The other thing is, uh, for example, uh, mentioned missing persons investigations. And you said, I think, three sessions. It's all on uh, May 25th. So that means that the consultant is doing three different sessions in that day. Correct. Where are you getting three sessions? That's what's in the document. Instructor to teach, for example, uh, I'll just pick one of them, not the one that Commissioner Hassler mentioned, but uh, the last one that you know, on the second page of what our document says with VISTA, three, uh, instructor to teach three sessions of a program entitled Policing in the 21st Century, Fair and Impartial Perspectives, all or appears to be, it just says on August 31st. It's three sessions on August 31st, which is what's prompting Commissioner Hassler's question. Yeah, so I don't have three. Yeah, I don't have the guidance in the jobs and the taxes with our agenda. Just so, which one did you say? Police in the 21st century is very impartial. Everything that this is doing at least three sessions, according to the documents I have. Okay, this one says a recommendation to approve the contract with this law enforcement. So, we'll see. Well, the St. Louis County Municipal Academy is an instructor to teach in a program of the entire police in the 21st century. And for August 21st, it doesn't break it down into the sessions. So there's a difference between the version that was sent out prior to the meeting and the one that's in our open. So which one is accurate? Um, it, it's just on that date. So it's all right. So this one, this one that I have in my hand would be the accurate one. Yeah. So what I suspect happened is when they prepare that document, there's multiple sessions throughout the course of the year. So that person will come in three times over the course of the year to what we're actually looking to approve is this one. So you'll see the difference. And Commissioner Asker, it sounds like you have the same one that I have. Right. So, yeah. right. so I'm not quite sure why you have older versions and they have the correct version, but it was probably caught correct, I would suspect. So you're actually only approving this one. Really Which might happen. That's the second time in the month it's happened. So we'll one day. So one day. So they won't have any circumstance where you have a, a class like this with multiple sessions at the same day. These are all one full day session. Right. right. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll fix it. We'll fix it. Right, so it sounds like we have a session, one session for each of these, not multiple sessions. Is that correct? All right. That's all of them. That's all the ones that have. Yes, sir. Best of, all right, thank you. Appreciate that uh, correction of, um, of what we have. Here. So when we approve, we'll be approving one session for each of these, not not multiple sessions. All right. And that, one more. Yes, ma'am. Okay, you, you read off a date of August 13th. Our version says August 31st. That is um, that is me reversing the numbers. So oh, we settled okay. it. Moving to that. I'm not running for the second guess. I can see that too. Thank you very much. Thank you for correcting. Correcting the dates. All right. With those corrections, maybe we have a motion to approve these contracts. To approve these contracts. Thank you. And with Mr. Becker's follow up next one. What it means between a four and five or you read this asset. Thank you. Any further conversation on the contracts? All in favor of approval? Aye. Any opposed? Very good. Dan Shelton. Again. We have one uh, general order. Order 98 social media networking. The revisions in this order were made to include additional modes of communication. Those restrict the release of certain sensitive information to restrict showing support for the spare to the comments, pictures, pictures, et cetera, over relating to specific groups. The order also now includes information regarding civil litigation, which may be imposed against employees of defamation, posting false facts, or using the work of another without permission, looking toward a recommendation that the Center for Policing Equity as well as earlier. Requirement for affiliated department associations to include a disclaimer on their website is also 
Hopefully you've had a chance to review the order that I sent out. Is there, are there any questions regarding social media? I had a question about section 3J. It's the um, employee responsibility to um, notify his or her supervisor of violations. Have we discussed how, whether, to what extent we're going to enforce that section? I mean, I guess my question is, can an employee get in trouble for knowing about a violation and not reporting it? And have we talked about what happens? I believe that was discussed before. I don't, I know that that was discussed by executive command staff as far as what the, I guess, BPS have a, yeah, it's, it's not a net order, but it, I don't know where it's going to get a general order that covers that saying that if you know of a violation, you don't. It's almost within that duty to intervene, right. like right. we've talked about, and with the new able training that's being pushed out department wide, it's kind of that same philosophy. But to answer your specific question, you know, I think they would deal with it the same way that they would any other disciplinary matter. Just case by case, and then legal review and things of that nature, trying to determine the appropriate based on whatever circumstances you have. So it's difficult. That's a difficult question to answer, no matter what the context is. But I think it would be case by case. So we did talk about it, but I think we just need to see what it looks like moving forward. Should that circumstance? Am I correct in hearing? It's analogous to any officer's obligation to report. An observed violation. Yes, ma'am. It's not. It's not exclusive of any other responsibilities. Just why it's included in one. But every order doesn't include. It's it does. Okay. Right. So it's sort of a belt and suspenders. No questions. I've got a couple of ones. Much more. Can step us back a bit. Give us the higher level. Reasoning for why we would need a policy like this. Talking social media overall. I believe that the, again, the, uh, this it would have been originally written in 2018. Uh, speak for them, Chief Belmer. Uh, why the order would have been written or why does the why does the Center for Police and Equity and why does Cook? Leah, why does why did Teneo recommend us update this? And well, and just so to answer your question about Center for Police and Equity, because I meet with them on a bi-weekly basis, and we had spoken about this particular order. I guess that their thing was across the country um, to other departments to have this policy or lack this policy. They do see disparaging remarks and things of that nature on social media from members of their department against certain ethnic groups. Um, so that's why it was important to them. One of the main things was about uh, like thumb, not being able to give a thumbs up to something that would be disparaging uh, to another group. So that's just speaking from the CDE standpoint. I literally just had that conversation with a month ago. Um, and Teneo's recommendation was the, was the same thing. So I did. Again, if they're seeing that from other agencies across across the nation, um, telling me that some of these don't even have social media policy in place. Um, that's the recommendation is to get it in place. So I guess social media is such a massive deal about it, and it's uh, especially with younger generations, obviously. So we spoke last time more than 50% of the millennial generation now that use social media. I don't know a whole lot about it on social media. So it seems like, and as I read it, part of the reasoning was it is protection of the community, it is protection of the officer, it is protection of the department. If someone does use, fails on their discretion and does something they shouldn't be doing, that might misrepresent a individual opinion for that of the department. Or Absolutely, and reflect it, you know, negatively and just uh, as a whole. Yeah, finding that balance of free speech versus what. So that that that's what I was trying to get to, right? This is a pretty comprehensive policy for those of you who may not have read it to try to find that balance between yes. things that are going on in society right now. And speak for executive command staff had a very good discussion regarding all this. 
know that we've had this for four years now. Have we had any violations of this? Have we done any um, investigatory work around people who have? Okay. So it does, in fact, have substance to it. Yes, sir. Thank you. Any other questions? So your recommendations for our approval of the new GO? That's correct, sir. Thank you. I have a motion to approve. We move that we approve this general order by general order 2209. I've seen it. Was that a second? Yes, sir. Uh, any further conversation? All in favor of approving GO 22098, please say aye. Any opposed? Thanks, sir. All right, anything else to discuss before we um, talk about moving into? Of session and the reasons why. Uh, no public comments were recently. Is that? I sure did. No public comments. Thank you. All right. Board of Police Commissioners may vote to go into closed meeting for the legal advice or review claims and lawsuits involving the police department, section 610-0211, RS Muslim sections 114-0201, SL Sierra, discussion of employee and personnel matters, section 610-0213. And 13 RS Mo and section 114-0203 and 13 SL Zero and update on union negotiations, section 610021, 9 RS Mo and section 114-0209 SL Zero and discuss discussion of requests for proposals, section 610-02112 and section 114-02012. Have a motion to hold move to closed session. Move that the board goes into closed session. Second. Thank you. Conversation for moving closed session. Once we remove the closed session. Oh, roll call. Thank you. Commissioner Ashley? Yeah, yes. Commissioner Banks? Yes. Commissioner Haslin? Yes. Commissioner Schwerner? Yes. We are in closed session. We have to note there is a roll call. Yeah, we did have a vote in closed section and it was yes to return to open session. We're now in open session. Section L of our agenda with appeals hearings. We will not address that uh, during this meeting. Our next board meeting is scheduled for April 13th. So Diana, if you and I can work on um, availability of a location that will allow for public uh, public attendance. I do have one thing proposed. Um, I propose a resolution to commend the chief's involvement as a Kalia assessor and that we appreciate his time and continued development as a national leader in law enforcement. I second that motion. All in favor? Consideration. Thank you. Anything else? Shall we close the meeting? Uh, Commissioner Ashworth? Yes. Commissioner Banks? Yes. Commissioner Hasslin? Yes. Commissioner Schwerin? Yes. We're officially closed.